I'm Marcia Keene, the chairman of Feinstein Keene Healthcare. We're one of the co-conveners of the Turning the Tide initiative. Um, it's my pleasure and privilege today to introduce Steve Uvel, the president and CEO of Pharma, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, to introduce our spotlight on partnering to deliver high-value care for patients um, that was organized in collaboration with the Value Collaborative. Mr. Yuba leads Pharma's work preserving and strengthening a healthcare and economic environment that encourages medical innovation, new drug discovery, and access to life-saving medicines. In 2016, Modern Healthcare named him one of the top 20 most influential people in healthcare. So with that impressive beginning, Steve, thank you for joining us today. Please come out. Thank you very much. It's a, a delight to be here this afternoon. As many of you know, um, I'm relatively new to pharma. Uh, just a quiet time to join the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, but I've been there about a year and a half, and I've, I've made a real effort to get out into the field uh, to meet with researchers and scientists, uh, tour the labs, uh, really try to flatten my curve on where the science is going, um, of course, as well as sitting down with providers and, and patients. And I have to say, in, in taking somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 trips over the last year and a half, I've come away truly blown away, really excited about the progress that's being made uh, in our member companies. You know, really, if you think about some of the, the new advances, there are things that would be referred to as science fiction just a few years ago. So harnessing the body's own immune system uh, to fight cancer or CAR-T, where you're taking cells out of the human body, modifying them and sending them back on smart bomb missions to, to really attack cancer cells and spare healthy tissue. Um, and I could go on in terms of tailored treatments uh, that really focus on you know, genetic mutations. Uh, FDA just approved uh, a medicine that uh, is targeting one, just one of those uh, mutations that will impact 17 different types of cancer. So I think in the future, we'll talk a lot less about where in the human body cancer resides and these uh, genetic markers that will continue to tailor treatment. And we're beginning to see the signs uh, of progress. So if you look at cancer mortality rates, Peaking in 1991, we're down uh, by over 25%. Uh, again, more and more uh, therapies that are arriving at FDA are, are tailored uh, in nature. Um, so it really is an exciting time in the science, um, and that's why we launched an effort called Go Boldly, which is uh, designed to really get people excited about the science again and get real researchers and patients, uh, scientists, providers, and others uh, talking about these advances. Um, we have a national advertising effort, but also we're hosting events around the country. But I think we all know that, that these uh, exciting advances um, need to be made available to patients, and we have to balance continued incentives for innovation with affordability and access. And, and for our part, we believe that the pricing model in our industry needs to evolve. We're, we're likely lagging other sectors in healthcare in this movement away from paying uh, for volume to paying for value. Uh, and so we think the pricing model needs to evolve. And that's why we launched the Value Collaborative, which is a part of the Goal Boldly effort to really bring stakeholders together. Uh, and this panel will explore how we can expedite the, the process of moving from paying for volume uh, to value. We have a model today that I think is somewhat convoluted and leads to a lot of questions on the part of policymakers uh, and patients, and oftentimes uh, doesn't flow to the benefit of patients directly. Uh, so we think there are targeted reforms that are needed to move in this direction. And it's one of those rare areas, frankly, in healthcare policy where, where all stakeholders um, are on the same page. I think our members want to move in this direction. Providers want to move in this direction. Payers want to move in this direction. And there are benefits for every stakeholder uh, in getting there. From a patient perspective, in, instead of having a rebate and discount model uh, that doesn't always, again, share the fruits of those rebates and discounts with patients at the point of sale, 
Uh, if you move to a volume-based, or I'm sorry, a value-based model where you're agreeing on specific metrics associated with patient outcomes, and then you vary the reimbursement, differential reimbursement based on the outcome achieved by the patient, typically those arrangements uh, provide for uh, greater patient access because the formulary is a preferred uh, placement in the sense that patients have lower out-of-pocket costs associated with those uh, drugs that are subject to a value-based arrangement. From a provider's perspective or a payer's perspective, we, we have to acknowledge, I think, that not all uh, patients benefit equally from a medicine. And um, if you take cancer, for example, you may have a medicine that works really well in lung cancer and the data may be less mature in stomach cancer. We want to have a reimbursement model that, that again, allows for differentiation. Or if there are several uh, expensive cancer therapies that are being used in combination, uh, moving to a value-based arrangement can allow our members to provide novel discounts uh, for those products. So at the end of the day, we think this is one of the more promising areas in, in terms of balancing continued incentives for innovation, um, as well as access and affordability. And with, with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Susan Denser to introduce our panel. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Steve, and good morning to all of you. I th think it is still morning. Uh, so we're going to dive now into the uh, subject matter that Steve just talked about, which is enhancing value for cancer patients, of course, first and foremost, but also for the people paying the bills for those cancer treatments, whether they are uh, classic uh, purchasers and self-insured employers, whether they are health plans, and of course, whether they are taxpayers, uh, those of us who are helping to fund the Medicare and Medicaid systems care as much about this as anything. So all the stakeholders have a role in the subjects we've been talking about all morning, uh, enhancing innovation, making sure we get the best cures to the patients, the right, right cures, right patients, right time, uh, and in sync with their values and preferences, and also, as Steve said, maintaining a sense of affordability uh, in the healthcare system overall. So our panel today is going to take a deep dive into how we can work together across sectors within healthcare and with payers and purchasers and others to really drive this value equation forward. So I'm delighted to introduce our panelists very briefly. You have their bios, of course, in your packets. David Lansky is here. He's the president and CEO of the Pacific Business Group on Health, a group of large self-insured employers, not just near the Pacific, really nationwide, uh, as much as anything. Uh, Lori Riley is with us. She's the Executive Vice President uh, for Policy Research and Membership at Pharma, where she works uh, there with Steve on a number of the issues that he was describing. Bill Martin is with us. He's the Vice President and General Manager of Credo Commercial and Trade Relations at Express Scripts. Of course, a pharmacy benefit manufacturer involved in a lot of the arrangements uh, Steve was alluding to. And then Len Lichtenfeld, who's the Deputy Chief Medical Officer at the American Cancer Society, really looking across the whole of the cancer continuum now to make sure that we are getting uh, the best cures and the best value to patients. So welcome to all of you. What I've asked each of our uh, speakers to do today is just give us a few minutes of overview about the partnerships that they are involved in, uh, engaging with different sectors, or that they think that the whole continuum needs to go in to enhance value for patients and also address these issues of affordability and get to the situation of the right therapies for the right patients at the right time. So David, we're gonna start with you and the role that you've been playing at Pacific Business Group to help enhance uh, all of this for patients and for your purchaser community. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thanks, I'm glad to be here and I appreciate the theme of the conference. I think the large employers that I work with and by the way, we also have public sector members like the state of Washington and the state of California who have a shared concern about value in general and the cost of health care and the quality of health care in general. So obviously cancer care is very high on their radar. Typically a large employer spends about 12% of their health care spending on cancer and about 15% of their pharma spending is on cancer-related medications. So it's very much on their radar. It's in the top three or four things that almost every employer spends money on. 
And of course, in the workplace, in the community of workers, it's a huge impact emotionally, productivity, economically. So uh, it's very much uh, something that employers are sensitive to. Um, and I will say it's a very sensitive topic. Employers, more so with cancer than almost any other topic, are very hesitant to appear to be micromanaging the benefit design or the contractual arrangements because they really want to convey, and they mean, that they want every employee who needs access to innovative therapies, they want them to get it. And they really don't want to be fretting over the price of those drugs. They want to make them available regardless of price. But obviously, with the new therapies, these are very expensive drugs. Um, some of them have a very expensive upfront cost. Some employers have very high turnover, so they're spending a lot of money on someone who may not be with them very long. So it's a complicated issue for employers. I think in terms of the partnerships and collaborations that our members are looking at now, there's been a lot of interest in what you might broadly call second opinion services. So let me just put that in context. What value means to an employer, as we heard this morning, is the health outcomes that a patient achieves divided by the total cost of care for that person. And that total cost of care is not just the pill or the hospital episode or any particular small component of care. It's the entire scope of care until a measured outcome. So we're looking at the medical costs, the pharmacy costs, the mental health costs, the entire sweep, and the costs of the workplace of producti, of presenteeism and absenteeism and related costs. So we're looking for therapies and care systems which can comprehensively manage that cost. And obviously the cost of the medication is a very important component of that. So as we look at that whole complex array, what we really want to know are what outcomes are important to the patient, as we heard this morning, and what is the total cost of care. So we have two sets of metrics that are missing today. So the employers are very interested in working with partners who can answer that question. Now one slice of that is we're running into surprisingly high rates of, for example, diagnostic errors. Mis uh, inaccurate staging of cancer, inaccurate diagnosis of cancer. We had one of our employers had a patient diagnosed and treated for breast cancer who didn't have breast cancer. Um, we have uh, one remote service, an over, a second opinion service, that is finding 35% of referred cases with the wrong stage or the wrong diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So that's a massive inaccuracy in community care, which is only detected when we refer patients to centers of excellence of some kind. So at the most basic level, we have a, a supply system, if you like, for the employer that isn't always working. So the employers, in terms of partnerships, are looking for centers of excellence or clinical centers who will both make that right diagnosis and also manage the entire continuum of care. So looking at the new accountable care organizations as partners where they can demonstrate success at managing oncology cases um, is a very important component. The last thing I'd say, speaking specifically to the issue of drugs, is we obviously are very concerned about the high cost, the, the list price, the launch price of many drugs. We like looking at the value frameworks that groups like ISA are putting together so that we begin to have a better basis for evaluating whether we are paying appropriate prices for new therapies based on their total value. So we're also looking to collaborate with groups that are looking at these value frameworks and trying to find better ways to rationalize the conversation about total cost of care. I'm gonna stop there. Great, and just a quick follow-up, uh, David, because I know your group has had centers of excellence around other forms yes, of right. therapy, a joint replacement, for example. And one, one issue has been how much employers really want to push on employees to go to centers of excellence. Given the hesitancy that you mentioned around cancer, what a delicate issue that is, how, how is that working out, uh, steering in effect, uh, or what is the mechanism that enables you to bring in second opinion, for example, in a way that is responsive to patients' concerns? So I think there are two key factors from the patient's view. One is the employer typically makes it free to get that second opinion or center of excellence review. Um, and they make it as friendly as possible in one of the programs we're developing. After the patient gets a virtual review electronically, they are then allowed, if they wish, for free to go to the remote center and have an in-person review. When they come back home, the remote center will cooperate with the local PCP and oncologist to manage their care. So it's a very friendly uh, concierge kind of relationship. Um, so the one thing is it's free to you and your family to participate. The other is the centers of excellence are very well-known world-class centers. So to say to an employee who works as a retail store or in an uh, amusement park, I'm going to allow you to go to Johns Hopkins or Sloan Kettering for your care is a wonderful experience for the patient. And they come back raving to their coworkers, having had the opportunity to get really first-class care. Great. So Lori, David just mentioned essentially one out of every eight healthcare dollars 
that large employers are spending is on cancer. Uh, so we've got that reality. Uh, we know what the cost of cancer is across the whole, the healthcare system. And then we have everything that Steve mentioned, this amazing armamentarium of cancer drugs that's coming down the pipeline, some of which will be very costly, but also one-shot cures, mm -hmm. allowing people to give up the steady chemo regimen, potentially even other forms of therapy. Uh, how, what, what, what does pharma see now as the way to move forward in this? Steve mentioned, of course, bringing stakeholders together, the value-related work that you all are doing, and of course, the value-based contracting yeah. efforts that are now underway as both uh, pay purchasers, payers, and pharmaceutical companies look for ways to structure these new agreements. What's, what's the future from your perspective? Right. Well, thank you, Susan, and thank you for having me. I think, as Steve mentioned before, um, our association launched um, earlier this year what we're calling a value collaborative. And, and really, the goal was how do we increase the dialogue around value as it relates to our industry? And there's several pieces of that. Um, one, I'll, I'll build off in part of something David talked about, which is value assessment. I think there's an increasing interest among employers and others to have a better sense of, of what value means. I think. As we think about value, though, depending on who you ask, the value equation can be very different. And so where we've been focused is how do we have value assessment that really improves the ability for providers and patients to enter into a dialogue to ensure that, that patients are, are getting the best treatment for them. I think in the case of cancer, probably different than a lot of other diseases where you have uh, subpopulations of different types of cancer where you've got a very heterogeneic patient population where patient choice is really important. And I think some of the models that we've seen evolve over time, I'll use ICER as, as one example, um, take one perspective on value, I would argue largely through the eye of an employer looking at a short kind of budgetary window. Um, while that may be valuable again to an employer, I think we're saying let, let, let's take a bigger, more holistic picture of value and through the eyes of not just an employer, but through the eyes of the provider and the patient as well. Um, you know, that kind of builds on a, another area where we've been focused, which is quality measurement. I think in the area of oncology, one of the things we know is that we're woefully inadequate when it comes to quality measures in oncology. I think there was a recent study that Avalier did that found 85% of measures today in oncology are process-related measures. They're not really getting at outcome-related measures, certainly not necessarily getting at patient-reported outcome measures either, which is another area of focus for our industry. Um, Patient-reported outcomes are increasingly being used in the clinical trial process, but how do we make sure that if we're baking them into the clinical trial process and we're designing medicines that are geared towards things patients care about, that when we get to the coverage and reimbursement side, that those patient-reported outcomes find a home over there as well. And then, Susan, you also mentioned value-based contracting. Again, that's a very um, big area of interest for our industry, um, as it is, I think, for employers, payers, and the like. And that is, how do we contract in a different way? How do we get away from the current model today, which is we come up with a drug, we get paid the same regardless of how it works for the individual. How do we make um, you know, better choices and how do we ensure that we are reimbursed and paid for the value that our medicines provide? But that oftentimes is dependent on having good outcome measures available. It may be dependent <coughs> on different areas of value assessment. So I view all of these areas as interrelated, but as an industry, we are investing heavily in all of them um, and wanting to have deeper conversations, again, not just with PBMs and payers, but with employers as well for where do they find value and how do we make sure that as we're bringing medicines to market, we're meeting the value equation for patients and, and the payer. Great. Well, and just, Lori, briefly respond to what David said. Employers obviously looking at value frameworks like ICER yep. as a mechanism there's been a lot of controversy around ICER. Of course, ICER has adapted to some of the criticisms of the model. Where do you see the whole frameworks discussion mm -hmm. in particular going? I think it continues to evolve. As you, as you said, ICER has made some, some changes to its framework. I think for, for us and for we're probably not alone, um, what we'd like is an open and transparent process so it's very clear what the methods are being used, um, opportunity for meaningful engagement from patients, from providers, from, from our industry as well. And 
a look beyond simple kind of shorter budget windows. I think that's been a concern of ours. And, and I understand where the employers are coming from. As David mentioned, employees don't often stay with the same firm for, for you know, five or 10 years. But I think when it comes to an individual's health, they think about their health not in a how long am I with uh, FedEx. They think about my health in terms of my entire life. And so I think the closer that we can align frameworks to, again, not just one individual's perspective, but a more holistic perspective, I think they're going to see value beyond just the, the payer perspective. But I think patient organizations, um, as some of these models have evolved to include decision-making tools, I think that's really important. How do we give tools to patients so that they can engage in a conversation with their provider about what's important to them as well? Because patients have trade-offs and they can make choices, but they need the adequate tools to allow them to do so. Great, great, well thank you. So Bill, Steve mentioned uh, the prevailing model in drug purchasing of course has been volume contracting, discounts and rebates attached to those contracts. Obviously PBMs have played a, a key role in that process. Now we're evolving to these new set of arrangements, potentially more value-based contracting, and then in the case of the, a lot of the work the Express Scripts has done, indication-based pricing, speaking to this issue that you might have a drug approved for several different indications, or you may have it being used off-label for different indications in the case of cancer. And then we could add a further complexity that you often have combination therapies, patients on more than one drug. How is Express Scripts working with others now to sort its way through these issues? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, yeah, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. I would, uh, I'd like to start by saying that uh, we're all very fortunate to live in a time where we have so many medications that are available today that just a few years ago were, I mean, we're not. I mean, they are, they're, it's really miraculous what's happening now. And this drug innovation is something that we all want to see continue. We need to see it continue as a society. I think we're all aligned around the fact that, that that's very important. It's a, a great benefit to all of us and definitely needs to continue. Uh, the challenge always comes in, like as Lynn and I were talking prior to here, it's just paying for all this darn stuff is where controversy comes in. If it weren't for that, it would all run you know, pretty smoothly. But unfortunately, that's a reality we have to, you know, we have to face. And as a society, um, you know, back to Lori's comments, we move away from the individual situation, let's think about it more holistically. There's really, I mean, none of this comes without some expense. I mean, whether it's a, a patient copay at the at the retail counter of a drugstore, or whether it's the the monthly premium that a worker pays, or whether it's the tax dollars that we all pay to support these programs, the money comes from somewhere. So, I think for a number of years in our country, we've had a, uh, if you will, a social contract that's existed uh, between. Um, the pharmaceutical manufacturers, the providers, the insurance companies, and patients. And there's this feeling that pharmaceutical manufacturers are going to make these incredible drugs that are going to benefit us. They're automatically going to get covered by the insurers. Patients will be able to afford them, will benefit from this as a society, and that creates more capital to go back in to just make this whole cycle work. Well, much of what we're seeing today of the kind of pointing to the, you know, this should be fixed, that should be fixed, or whatever, is a result of the feeling that that social contract has broken down for many of us, right? And there are a number of things that have led to that. But that has led to this blame game to point to the models that are, this, this one's wrong, this player's wrong, et cetera, and there are all, you know, varying opinions uh, on that. But that leads me back to that question of, well, it's the old model of rebates, discounts, we're moving to value. I, I think we need to be careful not to think of that as an either or proposition because, for example, oncology is what we're all here to talk about today, right? We've already discussed how it is a particular pain point for, for affordability right now, and oncology is one of the least rebated, least discounted categories in the pharmaceutical world. In fact, uh, Express Scripts, we've launched several uh, care value programs, uh, one of them in oncology that covers roughly a quarter of the uh, uh, oncology pharmaceutical spend now. And within that book of business, two of those drugs are rebated and those rebates are in the single digits. So just for perspective. So 
that ties us back to the whole, it's not an either or, it's gonna take a mix of, of various solutions to make this thing work. This move toward value-based contracting is certainly a logical direction for all of us to go. We're very big advocates of it. There are a couple of twists on that. There's the one that's the value-based where we think about outcomes orientation. There's also what we would call indication based pricing, which gets at this idea of if a drug works really better in one indication than another, should the cost be the same on those? And um, just a, another commentary on that, I think a good example of, of that that we often point to is Tarceva. And Tarceva is a fantastic drug, so this is not a question about Tarceva's effectiveness, but that drug, when used in a non-small cell lung cancer patient, the studies indicate that progression-free survival increases by more than five months. It basically doubles for those patients. Wonderful benefit. And that same drug in a pancreatic cancer patient adds to the overall survival 12 days. So the point of this is not, well, one type of cancer's patients, you know, days of life are more valuable than another's. That's not where we're going with this. The question that we're raising is, should a patient uh, taking that same drug, non-small cell lung cancer versus pancreatic cancer, should that cost be the same for both those, in, those indications? What's, what's the value that's being delivered there? It's the same six or $7,000 a month. Is that really where we should be? So those are some of the norms I think that we're, we're being forced to address now. And the, I think it's fair to say that most of the payers, their real concern here is looking at this pipeline of wonderful drugs that we want to be able to take advantage of. We need patients to be able to have access to those. But affordability, if we're not carefully managing what we have today, affordability for the future will not be there. And that's probably the greatest danger I think we all face. And the challenge on us will be making sure that we collaborate and work together and move out of the finger pointing to find the solutions because there is no one solution that will fix this in its entirety. Well, there is one, but I don't think we're all probably pushing for that direction. I mean, it kind of gets to the idea, do you believe in more government regulation and we move to evolve to a single payer system or do you believe more in the what are considered traditional American values of individualism and market forces will, will prevail and competition is good and so forth and less regulation is actually uh, a, an alternative there. So, I, you know, so what's the right answer? We'll have to work together to explore that, but I think collaboration is key because without that, we just continue to put patients, uh, I think, in the middle of this. They're frustrated, the lack of affordability, the complexity of the system, and that's the last thing any of us want to see. Well, what the right answer is, I'm sure this panel is prepared to answer that, and we'll circle back. Look forward to, to listening to that. In just a moment. Yeah. So, Len, from uh, American Cancer Society's perspective, how do you see the need now for the various stakeholders to work together to address some of these issues that have been identified? Well, my colleagues here, thanks, Susan, and it is a pleasure to be with you, and my colleagues here have sort of touched on a lot of bases, and, and you touched on, I mean, I, each one of you mentioned something I was going to say, so I should just be quiet and say thank you, and we can move on. Um, I, I don't want to sit here today and not lose sight of the fact that a couple blocks down the, down the street here, uh, there's a major discussion here, and the whole value conversation may stop dead in its tracks if people don't have access to care. Uh, and that's critically important. If you want to know where the American Cancer Society's emphasis is this morning, it's being in, in those halls making sure that we don't lose what we already have for the care of our patients. I was reminded uh, the other day in a conversation with someone, I don't want to give too many details, having to be someone with breast cancer, it's recurred, it's advanced, and even with insurance, even with insurance, can't get medical care because there are all sorts of other considerations that go into it. So let's never forget that that is the key driver between this entire conversation. The comments that were just made were actually, I think, critically important. We wanna make sure from the American Cancer Society perspective that people have access to the medications they need. Uh, I remember one, a number of years ago when I was in Baltimore in practice, uh, and HMOs were just becoming active in the Baltimore market. They were very active in the Baltimore market. One of my colleagues turned to one of uh, his patients who wanted to go to Hopkins, as it turned out, for a routine uh, gynecologic exam. He, and she was re he refused to give her permission to do it. He said, ma'am, you're now going to get the medical care you need, not the medical care you want. And that's a fundamental issue that I think that, that you just sort of alluded to. 
Um, we still have, and these are, none of these, by the way, are new conversations, and none of these are new issues, and none of these were not foreseen. We are, we're in a situation now where we are uh, going to decide what kind of a society we want to be, what kind of regulation, what kind of oversight, what kind of requirements. Are we, in fact, going to be a free market, innovative-based uh, environment, or are we going to go with more government control, where the government, as is more accepted in, in European society and other parts of the world, where the government takes that ICER information or another organization's information, and, or NICE being the example in the UK, and says, no, we are not going to provide this medication. It's simply too expensive. And um, not to belabor the point, but this is, only the be this is frankly the beginning of this conversation and not the end. We've all seen the, we have seen the articles and the research papers that have shown what, some, unfortunately, and I'm in the company of pharma folks and I respect them a great deal, and they know that. But the fact is there are some players out there that have done some things over the course of time that are very difficult to explain and understand. On the other hand, I sat at a meeting in this city not so long ago, maybe about uh, eight, 10 years ago, where they actually stood there and said, we have, we're gonna have the death of innovation in pharmaceuticals because the venture money is not going to be there to support the innovative findings. Parallel at that very same meeting, somebody presented the data on vemurafenib. So it wasn't that long ago, which was one of the first drugs that really turned the tide, literally turned the tide in melanoma. And here we are X number of years later, and we have incredible investments, incredible enthusiasm, incredible entrepreneurship going on all over this country. And I've had the privilege and pleasure of being involved in those discussions. But what are we going to do? And I'm not here to have that answer, but it's clear that the question, because right down the line, not far away, coming to an institution near you, perhaps not near you, but available to you, are going to be, as Susan referred to, the single shot therapies. We don't know how well they're going to work. We don't know how long they're going to work, but they're going to work. They're working now. And some of these, now these, are, these are drugs that are changing the discussion. I, I wrote down on my notes the, the concept of hedonistic value. Those of you who are econo economists understand the hedonistic value, the value of enjoyment of life is now going to become a factor in these discussions. We have melanoma patients. I took care of melanoma starting in 1972. The drug that I used in 1972 was a mainstay of treatment in, 19, in, in 2009. 2009 the same drug, and was doing almost nothing. And now we have 35, 40% of patients with advanced melanoma who are responding, and some of them are long, having long quality of life. Not just a matter of saying, I don't have cancer, but actually engaging full time in life. And those, with the, with the CAR T, that potential is going to expand even further. Small numbers of patients, these are not large markets, folks. Small numbers of patients, finite periods of time, we're gonna to have to rethink, number one, value, and we have to think about innovative financing mechanisms. Because the traditional, I'm an employer, I have an insurance policy, I'm going to shell out X number of dollars for treatment, will not work. And I do think, one, one final point, I think was probably going to make the difference in this discussion and force it very much in the forefront, are the use of immunotherapies, uh, and in particular, lung cancer because now we're moving in from a small market to a much, much bigger market. And then, of course, the combinations of therapies such as we've seen in melanoma, and, and I'll allow Susan, because you're more the expert than I am in this, clearly finding innovative ways for collaborators to work together, knocking down the barriers that exist, the regulatory, legislative, state-by-state -state barriers that exist to allow it to happen, to have innovative uh, discussions about management of intellectual property, and so we can move this forward because this is the beginning, again, the beginning of the book. We're going to be seeing combinations. We're going to be seeing clinical trials. We're going to have to engage a nation. We have to do it in a more effective way. And by the way, let's not even talk about the medical care system, which is systematically broken with systems, with information systems that don't work the way they're supposed to work that would help us accelerate this. I, I would suggest, if you haven't, listen to, to, to uh, former Vice President Biden and just listen to what he says because he's got it right on target. We can do better, we need to do better, we need to break the silos, we need to get the information flowing, we need to have innovative ways of looking at these things, and then we'll talk about the value equation, what it means to literally be able to have people whose lives are genuinely saved in a very meaningful way. 
Well, thank you, all of you. And let us tee up for a brief discussion for all of us one very central question that has emerged from this discussion. And then we do open, have some time to open it up to the audience. Um, so David, you pointed out the rapid turnover of, uh, of the employee base that many large uh, uh, companies and other organizations face. Uh, uh, Len, you've just teed up for us the fact that we may be going down a path of taking people off health insurance as opposed to putting on people, uh, people uh, not as opposed to putting people on insurance. Um, for many reasons, it seems as if our system, God knows we have many strengths to it, is very poorly prepared at the moment for the phenomenon that you've described, Len, which is coming into the system with extremely high cost very effective drugs that could be, as you said, in some instances, one-shot deals. So there's Disney or Walmart or whatever thinking about, do I spend $2 million on a CAR-T drug for a given patient who may be working for another employer next year, um, let alone is this person going to have insurance and access? Uh, so as wonderful as our system is, it seems very poorly prepared to step up on this particular question. Uh, unless we come up with some other solutions and are certainly clearly working across sectors as all of you have described. So let's take that. What's one step that you think we can do now to begin to move into a realistic discussion about how we will take our system forward to address this issue? Lori? Sure. Um, thank you for the question because it comes up a lot. I would say a couple of things. First, um, I, I agree that we have this enormous pipeline, particularly in the oncology space, that I truly believe will be transformational. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to figure out how can we ensure that patients are ultimately going to get access to those therapies. That's you know ultimately what it's all about. And the financing piece, I think, is important, although I do think sometimes we ignore the fact that our healthcare system today already deals with a lot of big financing issues. I think about the Medicaid program and just dealing with nursing home care, where 40% of their care is focused in nursing home care. Um, I think of my own experience with a, a mother who had ALS and the fact that it costs about a quarter of a million dollars to treat a patient today with ALS. Um, in part because most patients end up in the nursing home. Same with conditions like Alzheimer's. So if we do, in fact, innovate and, and get new therapies to market, whether they're for ALS or Alzheimer's, some big ticket items where we spend a fair amount of resources, we're facing those costs. You know, in the oncology space, I think part of the discussion we've had today about how we move to value you know, there are, and, and Len pointed them out, some real barriers in the system today that make it harder to, to go where companies want to go, where payers want to go, where everyone wants to go. I liken it to um, today we're, we're told, here, you can make lunch and I'm going to give you peanut butter and some bread. And that's your limitation because you're playing within those parameters of basically peanut butter and bread to design your lunch. If we're able to change some of the rules around how we operate so that we could bundle therapies together in a way that doesn't um, impact our price reporting, so that we could offer services to ensure patients can truly get access, whether it's transportation to a facility or the like, which we know are real barriers, without getting pulled into the anti-kickback statute. I think instead of dealing with just peanut butter and bread, we're going to be dealing with whole foods in terms of how much options there are in terms of creative ways to make make that lunch or make that contract. And, but right now, there are real barriers there. And I think there is interest from lots of parties to say, let's look at those barriers. Let's find ways, and I'll give credit to Express Scripts for being creative on how we get to indication-based prescribing, but arguably having to do it in a bit of a convoluted way to not trip up price reporting issues. How do we look at the framework, which was designed for a period of time 50 years ago, and say, in addition to the innovation progressing, our payment systems, the rules, and the guidance around it have to innovate too so that we can go into this new era where payers and employers feel like they truly are paying for value and they're not paying for things that aren't working and they're prideful about what they're paying because they know it's making a difference to patients. We're not there yet and we have a ways to go, but I think there is some glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel in terms of interested parties wanting to work together to get there. Great. Okay, I want to hear what the rest of you have to say about this, but we also do want to open it up to any questions or comments from those of you in the audience. 
So if you do have a question, okay, let's take one right here. And please, of course, come to the microphone. Hi, <clears throat> Richard Bankowitz with America's Health Insurance Plans. I want to ask a question of the panel. Where do sustainability and opportunity costs fit into the model of value? Because uh, we can't, uh, if we pay $2 million per therapy, even if it's a one-shot therapy, it means there's less money to pay for other things in healthcare or in society. Appendectomy is a one-shot therapy. It is <laughs> curative, and in, without the procedure, it is fatal. We would never allow an appendectomy to be priced at $2 million. As a society, it would be intolerable. It's not sustainable, and the opportunity costs are too high. So it seems there's a missing piece of the puzzle. One-shot therapies are great. Innovation is great. We want them, but it has to be sustainable, and we have to look at opportunity costs. How do we do that? I, I, oh. and, and the one value of a system, a single-payer system, is they can ask those questions, right? If we spend $2 million on a CAR-T drug, how many fewer kids do we immunize as a consequence? But, Bill, it looked like you were about to say something. No, I, I, or, I'm, or gonna, I'm, I'm just sitting here chomping at the bit on that one, you know? <laughs> Um, so, so we are now dealing in a world where uh, some of the more common diseases, so hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, used to be pretty expensive, but the problem was they were spread along a whole lot of people. And some, some procedures, like an appendectomy or a, even a heart transplant or something, is a pretty, not always, but frequently a defined set of care. What are you going to say, and this is going to, and I'm not being critical, but I want you to at least think about this. Um, we're moving into treatments. And the, the one that comes to mind in the discussion that I had for inherited retinal blindness in newborns, 1,200 children a year in the United States born with this condition, a gene therapy that is proving successful, so I'm in the early stage, but successful in reversing the blindness in that child. Now we have to start thinking a heck of a lot differently than we would have thought otherwise. With that appendectomy example, Fortunately, thank God, most of the people who get an appendectomy do very well, go back to work. In fact, now they even go back to work in a couple of days. You know, it's a whole different world from what it used to be. Um, gallbladder surgery used to be six weeks out. Now it's a, you know, go get it done. But that blindness is going to give that kid life forever. They're going to be productive. So when we talk about economic analysis and economic value, we are now going to have to start thinking in a different set than we've ever had the opportunity before. What's the value of sight? What's the value of not having to have further medical care or at least minimal medical care? What, that, that's a different paradigm. So I think it's, I'm going, to have, I'm going to respectfully say to you that I think we need to engage in that discussion. I think that we spend too much on a lot of medical care in this country. I think we could do much better. I think the costs are out of control, and I say that as someone who's directly involved in helping to engage the physician payment system for 25 years. I know where the, where the money's buried, and it's in a lot of different places. There are no, you know, a lot of not clean hands. But I want you to think if you have a patient with sickle cell anemia, I want you to think if you have a patient who's on death's door from the leukemia and lymphoma, I want you to think about people like, I don't want to get, well, you know, look at President Carter. What was it worth? I don't know the immunotherapy made the difference, but it was part of that therapy. What's that worth to be able to get out of the medical care system, return to functional life, and now we're talking about situations such as sickle cell, where you're talking about a lifetime free of pain and engagement in fundamentally productive social activities and personal life. That's a different discussion than what we've had so far. So with, all, with respect, the million dollars we spend on some folks, get it. I understand it. But this is a little different discussion. I don't think we're disagreeing. I think it's important to look at all of that. I'm simply asking the question, how do we make it sustainable? Right? Because the economic principle at play is a very simple one. If a trend cannot continue forever, it will stop. Okay. So it stops with price control, which nobody wants, right. or it stops in other ways. That's, that's the simple question. Too, too long a discussion for here. I'll be glad to talk to you afterwards. But there are people looking at innovative financial mechanisms. The hep C ex experience for some states is a most recent example. A lot of people in the states, the Medicaid programs, very expensive treatment. How do you pay for it? 
Well, some folks are actually having those conversations. It's too much for this yeah. discussion here. I'll be more than glad to talk to you, but innovative financing mechanisms may need to be brought to play in order to help make this a more sustainable enterprise. And there are some pretty sharp people who are ready, to, to, ready and willing to start engaging in the, the discussion and the financing to make that happen. I do so, think, oh, if, if I could just quickly respond, sustainability is an important question, and I, I would say that that is not one that, that we certainly ignore. I do think, you know, medicines, and we often don't talk about this, but it is very different than other forms of healthcare in that there is a limited period of time for companies to introduce a product, to have patent protection, and then over time, those patents expire, generics come to the market. Today, 90% of all medicines um, that are used are generic medicines, and the price falls out. So today, the, the penicillin that keeps many people and have kept many people alive, or the polio vaccine, uh, again, analogous to your abendectomy comment, but the prices for those have fallen. I would probably argue that the price of an abendectomy has gone up, not down over time, despite the fact that the value has remained constant. I think the, the same cannot be said for pharmaceuticals, where a very valuable statin today is pennies relative to what it was a few years ago, in part because we have a life cycle with prescription medicines where they do enjoy patent protection for a period of time, but they compete, again, in the hepatitis C case, they compete with other brands and that competition lowers price. Then generics enter and the price bottoms out and people enjoy those for many, many years ahead. And in that way, that cycle helps us afford you know, not to say we can't ignore the current affordability challenges, we need to talk about those too, but that in part provides headroom for the new innovation that's coming. Not to mention the fact that we pay about five times for an appendectomy what other countries pay <laughs> for an appendectomy. So let me give the last two words <laughs> uh, to David and to Bill, just to round out this conversation. We are a bit over, but so I, 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 I can respond to both the last two yeah. comments because we haven't talked a lot about price per se. But to your last point, Susan, um, you know my employers have employees in India and Germany and other places, and they are paying much less for the same drugs than their American employees are paying, which raises this question of what is the burden on the American economy of sustaining the innovation driver that we're talking about? And all these discussions we've had come back to transparency. So if we're gonna have a conversation among all of our stakeholders mm -hmm. about how to rationalize the cost of these therapies, we have to be transparent about where the money's going, who's making it, who's spending it, who's contributing to the collective investment in this process. Uh, we all have different motives and constraints that we have to deal with. But the conversation has to be enlightened by transparency, both on the dollars and on the outcomes. And we haven't done as much as we need to to elevate the sort of data infrastructure for that conversation. And Bill, I true just, last word. Kind of the last thing I would say, more than a couple words, but not many more. <laughs> just uh, patient always first, clinical considerations always first. That's what unites us. Uh, we do have differences in, in ideas on how to solve this, but I think the thing we'll all agree up, upon is that we like the innovation. We want to benefit from that innovation as a society. We have to carefully manage the resources that we have today to ensure future affordability. Well, I'm thinking about a sign uh, that I saw uh, on Google Images. It's a big green sign, like a highway sign, and it says, Destination Value. Enjoy the journey. You can tell this is going to be a long, interesting, somewhat torturous, complicated, and very important journey. Join me in thanking the panel for surfacing a lot of the issues.